Welcome to A Growing Concern. We're going to talk about an issue tonight that's really large, genetic engineering, and we're going to drill down on a couple aspects of it, and we'll probably go laterally and talk about other aspects of it as well. But mainly we're going to talk about genetically engineered trees and some moves there somebody is making to bring in eucalyptus trees. We got Mark DeMarat with us tonight, who's with Northwest Rage. That's Northwest Resistance Against Genetic Engineering. And we're going to discuss this a little bit. Welcome to the program, Mark. Thanks, Jim. And here we are again. Here we are again. <laughs> You're no stranger. I also work with Mark yes. on Bark, which is the uh, forest act activist group. And uh, but I've known you longer than that from from yeah. this here. How long has Rage been? Uh, since spring of 1999. So oh, you've been around a while then. Yeah, ten and a half years. There's also a Northeast Rage. Yes. Yeah. So that's great. So. Uh, want to go right into the genetic engineering or maybe you want to just talk a couple three minutes about what the situation with why genetic engineering isn't isn't good true uh, genetic engineering is basically being foisted upon us by the biotech industry in this case and uh, through the patent system and the the patent regime that is being allowed through the, the US uh, Supreme Court system we now have about 14 different crops that are now genetically engineered in the, in the U.S. and oh, well over 100 million acres of GE crops in the United States. And this new uh, attack or new uh, mode for the biotech industry is to get into long-lived or perennial crops. Alfalfa, which we'll talk about later, uh, which is a perennial crop, and now uh, again with this company called Arborgen, which is a conglomeration of Mead, West Vaco, and International Paper, they're now trying to basically commercialize genetically engineered eucalyptus trees. So it's not a, it's a, not a new player, it's just a, a grouping of old players. Yeah, and, and Arborgen has already done some field trials in the last couple of years on genetically engineered eucalyptus, very small trials, 1.1 acres, 7.6 acres, and now they're actually trying to uh, get the uh, USDA, the folks that are supposedly regulating this whole system, to allow them to do uh, 330 acres of genetically engineered eucalyptus trees. Basically, it's about 260,000 trees. And they're calling this a field trial, where in reality, all the other field trials that we've ever seen in the U.S. have been two acres or three acres or one acre you know, a couple of acres, and this one is huge. It's 260,000 acres, 260,000 trees, 330 acres across seven different states. And in one spot across seven different states? Well, in, in, different, in different areas. And, and the traits that they've engineered into this eucalyptus, which, as we know, if you've ever gone to California, is an invasive species. We brought it over as a landscape tree. From Australia, wasn't from it? From Australia. Yeah. And it's now taken over all sorts of habitats in... Uh, in uh, California and you know if you read the news last year the the fires in Australia those fires just went raging at 60 70 80 miles an hour through all these eucalyptus uh, forests in in uh, Australia and caused this massive damage loss of life etc so now they've engineered these eucalyptus to be cold tolerant because generally in the US even as a landscaper um, you can't plant a whole lot of eucalyptus. Some species actually can survive here. You don't here. see it up here much. Yeah, it's not much. And so it's, it's very, you know, it's a tropical uh, tree. It needs, you know, hot climates. So they've engineered it to be cold tolerant, to have reduced lignin. And the lignin is the, uh, the compound in the tree that has structure and rigidity and allows it to be strong and, and straight. And also um, to be herbicide tolerant. And so... What they're doing basically is they want to replace the southern U.S. state's pine forest plantations with this very fast-growing, cold-tolerant, low-lignin eucalyptus species so that they can grow, for one, for biofuels, and two, so that they can make pulp and paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the pine trees grow fairly fast, but they're not fast enough for the industry, so they want to move to eucalyptus, which are very fast. They can grow... Uh, in two years, up to 55 feet. Mm -hmm. So they're very fast growing. I didn't want to move off the subject here, but just just as an aside, part of what Bark is doing is they're concerned about uh, threats to our environment 
coming under the terms of green and you know you're talking there they're going to be using this for biofuels and that's going to be kind of the way they're going to get under the door like they are with LNG like they're doing yep. things with with uh, geothermal and uh, just because something's green on the surface doesn't mean that it's really green. Well in this whole biotech industry and especially with these GE trees they are claiming that one of the other uh, aspects that they're engineering into it is uh, sterility or they're trying to create sterility and that is their greenwashing effect where you know all environmentalists and US Forest Service scientists and all sorts of other people are, are worried that eucalyptus which is already a known weed species of tree in California and other states um, they're trying to introduce sterility into these trees so that they won't cross-pollinate and they won't contaminate mm -hmm. and go into other forests or whatnot. These trees are so complex, their genomes are so complex that there is no such thing as 100% sterility. And Steve Strauss, the guy we've talked about before, who's from mm -hmm. Oregon State University, one of the major GE tree researchers in the country and in the world, he actually has claimed that there is no way that with this 260,000 tree, 330 acre field trial, that they can 100% say that there will be 100% sterility and that these trees won't be able to reproduce. So in fact, out of these 260,000 trees, we'll say 1% will reproduce and have seeds and pollen and you know spread their pollen and their seeds and basically con continue to contaminate you know, the forests of southern uh, U.S. You know, you, you talk about things spreading. I know that I forget what crop it was, but there's been crops that have actually spread. And then rather than the farmers in the area sue whoever it was that had that particular uh, species, they were able to sue the farmers for that. And so it opens yeah. up a whole can of worms. It's, it's never something really simple. I forget the fellow. It was in Canada, I believe. Percy Schmeiser, yeah. Right. That's, that's the crazy thing about the biotech industry. They have so much control of the United States Department of Agriculture animal plant health inspection service, FDA, all these different agencies that are supposedly regulating our food system and, and making it safe and sustainable and not, you know, having these problems. That the the industry is basically like like with this with this new uh, field trial application, we actually uh, in 2008 put in all these comments for this field trial. And they had already applied for this field trial, 330 acres, 17 or 260,000 trees. And they put out an environmental assessment, and they gave us a 60-day comment period. So we sent in all these comments. Uh, literature about cryptococ Cryptococcus gaudii, which is a fungus that infects um, eucalyptus trees. It actually kills humans and animals. I looked that up. It's pretty scary stuff. And we've got that now in the, in the Pacific Northwest. We've got it in uh, Canada, etc. And that is a real threat. And it's, it's only associated with these eucalyptus trees. And eucalyptus are not native to the U.S., so this is in, you know, a foreign invader. And we now have to worry about that as well, especially now that they're trying to do these field trials in seven different states. So that is an issue. Um, the, uh, and, 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 and these states are, just to, to let people know, they're Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas. Places that need jobs. Well, places that need jobs especially, and, you know, with the whole biofuels thing, a lot of these trees, um, you know, this is, they call it a field trial again, but it, it's so massive that in the end, uh, Arborgen, uh, the company that is, that is putting this out, really hopes that in their five years for this field trial, that in those five years, they're going to sway the USDA and APHIS and all these other agencies to allow them just to continue to grow them and actually to harvest them and put them into the pulp and paper you know industry and <laughs> the possibility for these trees to contaminate the southern forest regions is incredible i mean even if only one percent of them actually do produce you know fertile flowers and pollen and seeds and whatnot they will contaminate and because they're cold tolerant they're going to be able to withstand the very seldom or very occasional you know, cold winters that, that we get happened. in the South, yeah. which just happened, which yeah. is happening now, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, is going to continue. And now that they've engineered this tree to be able to withstand our climate, the very real possibility of them being a extremely weedy and competitive tree species has been greatly increased. They suck up lots of water. 
the South is in a drought right now. They've been in drought for two years. Mm -hmm. So we have to worry about that. And then, uh, you know, this is a, a major industry. It's International Paper and Mead West Vaco, the two largest paper uh, companies in the country. And they, uh, you know, are going to be cutting down these trees in their, in their mind and their hopes to produce pulp and paper. Mm -hmm. Well, we really shouldn't be making, you know, paper out of trees. We should be making it out of corn and hemp and, you know, all these other different substances that we already have that are sustainably produced. I was just, it was just was occurring to me, you know, why, why doesn't this group put, put their energy in, into lobbying in Congress to, to uh, allow hemp to be grown? And uh, they can grow that probably t at least two crops a year down there in that part of the country. Well, if they genetically engineered it, they would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. As, as yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, the whole right. patent system, which allows these companies yeah. to control their quote invention, even though they haven't invented anything, they've just taken genes from already existing organisms and uh, isolated them, haven't actually invented anything. Um, the patent system allows them to control that product, that GE eucalyptus tree or GE corn or GE soya or whatever, for 17 years. Whereas if they did it just through regular hybridization, they wouldn't be able Anybody to. could do it, and there's not as much money in it. So, I mean, the reality, the, the base reality is money. You know, mm -hmm. these people are doing, they're spending millions and sometimes billions of dollars to produce these GE crops, or in this case, trees, because there's so much money involved. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a video to play, but before we get to the video, uh, you keep mentioning contamination. Now, that eucalyptus can't cross-pollinate with anything else in the area. It, it's a foreign... So what would that contamination consist of? Well, that contamination would be um, their seeds, or their, basically their seeds being transported on the wind or with animals, etc. And spreading. To other areas of native forests or other plantations and whatnot and growing up. And those not being, quote, regulated by our, our uh, um, government. And we wouldn't even know. I mean, the pollen can travel at least six miles through bees, mm -hmm. four miles through other different kinds of bees. And if that happens, then you get a plant somewhere else that nobody even knows about, and it grows, and it starts, you know, shedding seeds and just contaminating more and more and more land area. And they're very fast growers. They're I very recall. fast growers, and again, they suck up lots and lots and lots of water. Now, isn't, um, now, isn't there some also genetically engineered poplars, or those aren't genetically engineered? Those are. They're, they're, they're still in the area. The, here. Yeah, they're still in the field trial area down in OSU with Steve Strauss again. Um, and those have not been, uh, there's lots of field trials, but this is actually the first massive field trial in the United States for genetically engineered trees and the first actual application really for what they call deregulation, meaning commercial application. So if this goes through, this will be the first perennial plant, a tree, that uh, would be allowed to be commercialized and from there, here on out, if this gets commercialized, it's so much easier for anybody else to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's time to stop them. This, this is it. I mean, this is, you know, as with all of genetic engineering, it's, it's always, you know, the it time. But this one is a big one. Because like you were saying, you know, if they grow it for five years, then the people are going to have work. They're going to be accustomed to it. The trees are going to be tall. And it's really hard to stop something once it's rolling towards the cliff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's time to start. You know, right, and start. now is the time. So we, we actually had, you know, uh, in 2008, they put out a, their initial environmental assessment on this 330-acre field trial. And we had 17,000 comments from citizens around the country That's and around lot. the world who said no. And a couple hundred who said yes, mostly biotech scientists and, mm -hmm. and biotech officials. Well, they love biotech. Absolutely. And so on this uh, field trial, we, you know, you can go to Northwest uh, nwrage.org or Global Justice Ecology Project to sign on to the petition. Right now we have about 900. We just put the, the petition up. But we are trying to get you know, 50,000 people to say no to this because this is a big deal. We need 200,000 people. We need a million people to say no to this. And it doesn't matter where you live in the world. We need anybody to do it. And so those 17,000 comments that we had in 2008 made the USDA put out a revised environmental assessment. And that's what we're dealing with now. And that's why there's this new comment period, the revised environmental assessment, which supposedly during this revised EA, they looked at some of the issues that we had brought up in 2008. Well, they didn't really look at them very well. Didn't really look at hydrology. They didn't look at you know water consumption, et cetera. 
And they didn't really look into invasiveness and weediness, the, the ability for these trees <laughs> the, to spread. The main problems with it. <laughs> exactly, the main problems, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so now we're, you know, we're definitely looking, uh, you know, again, it just came online. We have about 900 people signed up so far as, as opposing it. And uh, we definitely need more. So you can go to our website and access that petition. All right. Well, we're going to go into a video now, and uh, we're, we're, I think we got this streaming. Frank Mahoney got this streaming. We had audio problems before. I think we got those taken care of. So uh, we'll try to we'll see how that is working, and then we'll get that uh, link up so folks can, uh, can uh, access this possibly on the Internet. And this will be going on every week, we hope. So we got a little uh, oh, eight- or nine-minute video to play that uh, is in interviews with uh, some folks that uh, have something to say about this. This isn't science fiction. There are currently hundreds, perhaps thousands of test plots of GE trees already being grown in the open around the world. My name is David Suzuki. I am, by training and profession, a geneticist. And for 25 years, I had an active career in science, once having the largest genetics lab in Canada. I'm narrating this film because I'm concerned about the unseemly haste with which my colleagues and my peer group seem to be ready to rush in and begin to apply ideas in this revolutionary area, to apply ideas that I think are far too early to expose people either in our drugs, in our food, or out in open fields. Genetic engineering is the insertion of genetic material, or DNA, into the cells of a living organism, usually using a bacterium or a virus. The artificially inserted DNA, selected for a specific trait of interest, can be extracted from an entirely unrelated plant, animal, or microorganism. The result is a plant or tree that has been altered in a way that could never occur in nature nor could it be achieved through traditional cross-pollination or hybridization. Genetic engineering is a new and complicated field, which often yields unexpected results. In discussions I've had with my fellow geneticists, they often say, listen, Suzuki, we're just talking about DNA. DNA is DNA. What difference does it make what organism it comes from? We pull it out of this organism, put it into another, it's just DNA. They forget a fundamental fact. We study the genetics of organisms by breeding a male and a female of one species, looking at their offspring and breeding them through what is called vertical inheritance within a species. When you take a gene from one species and transfer that DNA into a totally unrelated species, that's a completely different kind of experiment. This is now called horizontal inheritance. We've never done that before, and it is absolutely bad science to say that we can look at vertical inheritance and use the same ideas to explain what goes on in horizontal experiments. It's just lousy science. This one gene, one protein, one trait caricature of how genetics works, that's the whole foundation of the biotechnology industry, is a complete misrepresentation of everything we know about how genetics in complex organisms actually works. Biotechnologists think genes are genes. It doesn't matter where you stick them, and they'll just function the way they normally do. Any geneticist who thinks about that should know better. Genes don't function alone. They function within the context of the entire genome. 
Nature acts on the entire genome because after fertilization, there are whole sets of genes turned on and off in the proper sequence so that you get the development of a complete organism. So that whole orchestration is an integrated uh, genome that acts as a complete entity. To take a gene out of a fish and stick it into a plant means the fish gene suddenly wakes up and goes, where the hell am I? Who are all these other genes around me? Because you've altered the context within which that gene is found. It would be like taking Bono out of U2 and uh, putting him into the New York Philharmonic Orchestra and say, okay, folks, play music. Well, you get noise of some sort, but nobody can anticipate what the, the sum total of that activity will be. It's just a mistake to think that genes act as if their traits are expressed regardless of where they exist. The promoters of this technology would have us believe that genetic engineering is somehow more scientifically precise than traditional forms of breeding of plants and animals, and that's simply not true. Genetic engineering is an inherently uncertain process. It's inherently hazardous. When genes from various flowering plants and bacteria and what have you are forced into the embryos of either our food crops or of, tree sp or of the cells from living trees, um, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know where those genes will land. And they don't know what effects it'll have on the underlying processes of gene expression that make a corn plant a corn plant or that make a poplar tree a poplar tree. One of the main problems is that those pushing the benefits of genetic engineering stand to gain enormously from it. Today, products of biotechnology are being incorporated into our food, sprayed onto our fields, and engineered into our medicines without our knowledge, with little public discussion, and with the active support and funding of governments. Even though there are profound health, ecological, and economic ramifications of this activity, the paper, timber, oil, and fruit industries are rushing ahead to genetically engineer trees. What we found through our research is that genetically engineered trees are truly the greatest threat to the world's remaining native forests since the invention of the chainsaw. Large paper, agriculture, and timber corporations are pouring vast sums of money into genetically engineering trees because they believe they will be more efficient and profitable. They hope to engineer traits so that trees kill insects. Trees resist toxic herbicides. Trees will have reduced lignin, the long fiber that gives rigidity to the tree and makes it difficult to manufacture paper. Trees that are sterile, producing no seeds, nuts, pollen, nectar, or fruit. The insertion into the cells of trees of the gene from a naturally occurring bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis, that produces Bt toxin that kills insects, would cause every leaf, flower, fruit, or grain of pollen of the tree to produce the insecticide. Advocates claim that this would decrease the need for applied chemical pesticides because pests would be exterminated by eating the tree. But geneticists know from experience that using an insecticide in this fashion selects resistant insects, putting the industry on a treadmill of requiring an endless string of different, often more toxic, pesticides. The pesticide can't be washed off because it's in every cell of the genetically engineered plant or tree. Because of this, there is no specific target and no real limit to what or who can be harmed. This toxin acts strictly as an insecticide. And this toxin is also designed to be expressed throughout the entire organism. In this case, you're, you'll see Bt toxin expressed from the roots through the trunk into the limbs and leaves of this organism 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for the entire existence of this organism from cradle to grave and even beyond. Already, crops genetically engineered to produce Bt toxin have unintentionally resulted in the evolution of Bt-resistant pests. The emergence of these superbugs 
has resulted in an increased use of even more toxic pesticides to try to control them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're right. Oop, here we are. We're yeah. back. Uh, that was interesting. You could watch the whole thing. Can you watch that on the internet? Could you get the whole thing? Yeah, possibly? through uh, GJEP global justice ecology project dot org that, I think we've got that graphic yeah. already up I saw it, just the tail end of it there so and this video goes into you know all the range of different uh, um, aspects that there are traits that they're trying to engineer into GE trees the the one that we're talking about mostly right now is the eucalyptus that is the the field trial they're start, trying to start but they are trying to introduce um, BT pesticide into every cell of the plant, so any insect that would eat the tree would die. Low lignin, uh, so that the pulp and paper making industry can uh, basically save money through the craft paper making process, where they use all this dioxin and all this, you know, or the end product is dioxin, all this nasty chemical process to break the paper fibers down to make paper. Sterility, which, you know, again, uh, there's never going to be 100% sterility. So the possibility or the reality of contamination of native forests and other ecosystems is pretty much always going to be there. So the video is, it's a good video, um, and, and people should watch it. We have it at, at Northwest Rage, or you can get it from Global Justice Ecology Project. Uh, it goes into all these different aspects of the whole issues surrounding genetically engineered trees. And so does, does this uh, global project you mentioned and Northwest Rage, if they go to those sites, is there ways that they can uh, send an email or, or sign yeah, up? Either, yeah, either, probably the easiest, well, I guess it goes either way, NWRage.org or GJEP.org, and they'll both have a link to this petition, this online petition, to tell the USDA no to this, you know, 260,000 tree field trial. Mm -hmm. You know, we mentioned before how they have control of it. I think I think it'd be well worth mentioning that uh, hasn't it been in the past? Uh, there's many revolving doors between industry and <laughs> agencies, but I think one of the most blatant is the is someone that worked for Monsanto and then went to work for the government to help write some kind of law. Yeah, you Michael know? Taylor. Michael yeah. Taylor. You know, you might kind of go into that a little bit. Yeah, just, he's, just to show what's going the dynamics of what's he, going he's, on. He's done there. a lot for the biotech industry, and now he's he's. To some degree, he's not really changed his tune, but he's, he's uh, a little more soft. Uh, but he started out as a lawyer for a firm in New York City, and they, start, they represented Monsanto. And then very shortly after that, he left that law firm and went to work and, and actually was given a, a new position in uh, the EPA and got uh, recombinant bovine growth hormone that was it approved and then after he was there for about a year and got that approved went, went through that whole process shuffled the, the rbgh uh, application through and, and got it passed in the u.s not passed in canada not passed in europe not passed in all these other countries who it's refused only, to use it right it's only 12 countries in the in the entire world that actually have allowed rbgh to be you know approved um, after he left the epa he went back to work for Monsanto as their director of government relations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's, he's done this cycle a few times. Mm -hmm. You know, this RGBH, just, to, just in case folks didn't know about it, it's a, it's a hormone that, a lot, uh, that uh, makes the, the cows create more milk. And in, I don't know, it seems to me that there was even subsidies already involved in, in the dairy industry where they didn't really even need to create more milk. Well, and, and yeah, and the reality is at the time they rolled this out, uh, we already had a glut of milk on the market. The U.S. government was buying mm -hmm. cheese and milk and drying it and, and storing it basically in silos and whatnot because there was so much already, milk already on the market. And, you know, in fact, what has happened for quite a while, uh, RBGH was putting a lot of small farmers out of work because their neighbor farmer, which was bigger than them, was using it, producing more milk and selling it, which was dropping the dropping price prices. of mm -hmm. milk. So that put the small farmer with 50 cows or 100 cows or 200 cows basically unable to compete in the marketplace. And now the campaign, you know, the multiple campaigns against RBGH have been winning. And, you know, Monsanto actually sold, and they call it Pozilac is the, the trade name. They sold their Pozilac division to Eli Lilly, huge chemical company. Um, but mm -hmm. Eli Lilly is now still trying to promote it, whatnot. But it used to be about 30%, 15 to 30% of US cows were injected with it on a weekly basis. And now we don't know the exact number, but it has been reduced drastically. Dean Foods, Wal uh, Walmart, 
Safeway, all these Albertsons, all these Tillamook, grocery right. stores, Tillamook. I mean, mm -hmm. all the dairies in Oregon, basically in Washington, have all dropped the use of RBGH because of public citizen involvement and people saying, "I don't want to drink this stuff. You haven't proven that it's safe, and I'm not going to buy it." You know, it, it, you, you get the organizations, the, the corporations behind the scenes that put that stuff out there, and they, they get it done so quick. And it takes years for citizens, yeah. activist groups such yeah. as Northeast and Northwest Rage, and and a, a number of others that to to get this stuff and get and get the, uh, the 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 citizens educated enough to be able to be conversant on these issues. It takes years. Yeah. And meanwhile, they made a lot of money and and uh, you know. Pumped a lot of of this stuff into people that drank it. I know that the uh, they, they don't they have to use more antibiotics and uh, it creates pus in the in the in the. Uh, yeah, be, because the the cow produces up to 15 to 30 percent more milk. Its udder is much bigger. Sometimes it drags on the ground. Plus, they get to have to be milked longer because they have more milk in them. And just due to that milking, they have more irritation of their udders, which requires them to use more antibiotics. And the allowable level of pus. And antibiotics in our milk was allowed to be increased by the USDA because of RBGH. And mm -hmm. same with all these other, you know, biotech uh, crops. Um, Roundup, Monsanto's number one best-selling herbicide, is the majority of you know GE crops in the in the world. And Monsanto petitions the EPA to allow a higher level of Roundup residue, this herbicide residue, in our food supply because farmers are using much more of it, and, and that will happen with GE trees as well. They've, they've found uh, that farmers have used an increase of about 383 million gallons per year of Roundup. Well, weren't some of these uh, genetically engineered uh, plants engineer, engineered in such a way that, uh, that it was resistance to the bugs, so they would have to use less Roundup, and it worked out the opposite? Well, there's, there's the BT. Uh, uh, crops, which are uh, the, the BT crops have a gene in them from a bacterium that produces the Bacillus thuringiensis protein that when the insect eats the plant, like corn or soybeans or whatnot, uh, the insect will die. The reality is, and, th and that does work to some degree, however, the reality is that those insects then become resistant to that mm -hmm. BT. So all the bugs, you know, 100 bugs will eat this corn plant. 99 of them will die, and that one that doesn't die is the one that's going to breed, and all of its progeny are going to be resistant to BT. So then you now have these superbugs. And there's bugs a, that are there's a lot of them, one out of exactly. 100 or whatever. And it's the same thing with Roundup. You can, you can, uh, it, the reality is when you put a pesticide or an herbicide or any of those chemicals out into the environment, 100% of the time, 365 days a year, life is very adaptable life is ever-changing. It's called biodiversity. And some insect or some plant or some fungus or some disease is going to find a way around what man has engineered into these plants and is going to become resistant to it. And that's what we've seen. Well, Dozens of mm -hmm. plants are now resistant to Roundup. Well, they're resistant because they don't get a killing dose. Well, and that's yeah. the thing. And because these farmers are spraying constantly with Roundup, the plants are constantly getting this, this dosage, and some of them aren't dying. Many of them are, some of them aren't, and it's the ones that aren't that are breeding and, and growing and spreading. Mm -hmm. well, it really seems to me that it's just so typical of uh, what's, what's, what's going on out there is this is a, a solution in search of a problem. I mean, there's, they come up with these things and they ram them down the consumer's throats when they're re really the only need for it is, is profit up right. on top. Right. And of course, the shareholders are all for it. Oh yeah, it's it's an unsustainable technology. There's there's just no way it can ever be sustainable. It's an unnecessary technology. We have all these other methods to produce our food, or produce our fiber, or produce our clothes, etc., from sustainable methods. It's unwanted. Nobody mm -hmm. ever asked for it. It's the biotech companies that that basically have forced it on us, especially through the whole revolving door and their their influence in in power politics and in the, the regulatory agencies. And it's unsafe. And that's to me. That is the the biggest thing about it. Is it's it's aside from the fact that you know it creates pus in the udders of the cows or it can be contaminating. Is these haven't been tested. Right. You know whether they're safe or not. They don't know and they don't care. Right. And and, and that is the scariest yeah, part of it. And that is the reality. And you know getting to alfalfa, uh, mm -hmm. one of the first uh, perennial crops that uh, the USDA actually allowed to be grown for two years um, through a Center for Food Safety lawsuit, we actually got them to 
to stop um, the allowance of growing alfalfa. But the uh, and and now with alfalfa, there's a there's a because the USDA did not look into the health effects and the environmental effects of growing this perennial crop, nor the effects on organic farmers or people who didn't want to eat a cow or milk or that was fed genetically engineered alfalfa. Um, Center for Food Safety brought a lawsuit and got the USDA to stop and found out that the USDA had illegally approved the use of uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa. And now Monsanto is uh, again trying to get alfalfa to be deregulated, to be commercialized again. And so now there's a whole nother um, comment period with the first environmental impact statement ever produced for any genetically engineered crop, ever. And the reality is, you know, our regulatory agencies are supposed to be protecting our food supply, are supposed to be looking into the health effects of plants and what it does to the soil and the water and the air and us and animals, etc. And they've never really done that. They've done these little environmental assessments which are very minor and they don't take very long to, to produce. And they're all wishy-washy, which is what we're dealing with the trees. And now for uh, alfalfa, we sued them and got them to stop planting genetically engineered alfalfa and forced them to do a long-term study of an environmental impact statement. Well, we took a look at the environmental impact statement. It's a couple hundred pages long. Didn't really take into account all of the comments that we brought up about how it's going to contaminate neighboring alfalfa farms mm -hmm. that may be organic or may not be organic, may be conventional. People don't want to eat cows or any other animal or, or organism that has been fed uh, genetically engineered alfalfa. It will contaminate other alfalfa fields. All these different impacts, and they didn't really look at it. So now the USDA is again proposing to just completely deregulate genetically engineered alfalfa, to commercialize it with no restrictions whatsoever. Even though we had thousands of comments mm -hmm. for this environmental assessment that they first did and through this lawsuit to force them to do this EIS. So now we have 60 days until February 16th to put in comments on the whole genetically engineered alfalfa issue. And both of these, the trees and alfalfa, are absolutely major uh, milestones in the genetic engineering movement. Uh, genetically engineered trees, you have till February 18th to put in your comments, so please go to those websites and, and sign that petition. And for genetically engineered alfalfa, you can go to northwestrage.org, nwrage.org, or Center for Food Safety, and also, uh, lodge your complaint. And these two crops are perennial. And these are the first perennial crops that the USDA has looked at to deregulate, to commercialize. And if these two go through, it is going to be so much easier for all these other ones, mm -hmm. insects, animals, humans, all these other aspects of the biotech industry to, to continue to, to become deregulated. So these two are very major, and I'm really glad that you had to have me on my show tonight because these are very important issues that we really do need to get tens of thousands of people to make comments on. Well, you mentioned that people made a lot of comments before and they went ahead and threw it open. Why would this make any difference? Is there more of a spotlight on well, this there now? Well, there is always that pessimism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cynical, maybe. Cynical, But yes. at the same time... And I am know. cynical in some ways, too. Um, but the power of the people eventually will win out, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and even beyond that, if... If we get, you know, 100,000 people, which I hope we do, to comment on the GE trees and to comment on the alfalfa and to stop the sugar beets, etc., uh, even if those are glossed over by this new administration, um, which so far hasn't shown too much uh, favor to the environmental movement, a little bit, but not too much. It hasn't moved too movement. much from the other one. No. Um, the power of the people can still say that we're not going to buy Mm -hmm. genetically engineered sugar that's produced from GE sugar beets. We're not going to, uh, we're going to not buy paper from international paper company anymore or Mead West Baco because we don't support mm -hmm. the genetic engineering industry. We're not going to buy uh, genetically engineered alfalfa to feed our cows. So in the end, we do still have the pocketbook that we can affect these companies with. Mm -hmm. And as we talked earlier, it is all about money. These and education. Right. These companies get through these 17-year uh, patent control systems, and they you know, are able to control 
these crops for 17 or 20 years based on the patent system. And if our government doesn't lead, then, you know, the people will. And we'll have to do that through not buying these products from these companies and making it very clear, not just not buying them, but making it very clear to those people by calling them or emailing them, et cetera, that the reason we're not buying your products is because of this factor. And this has worked in the past. The only one I could think of off of hand is Trader Joe's, that right. it has worked, that they have taken out any genetic engineered ingredients from from any of their... Yeah, and, and to this day, you know, Northwest Rage was part of that campaign, and in 2000, we got Trader Joe's to get rid of all GE ingredients in all of their products. And to this day, they're the only national grocery store chain that is 100% GE-free. And you, you can't even find a place to park in their, in, in their <laughs> lots. And people must... Right. I right. mean, people like their products, right? Because they are natural and healthy, and some of them are organic, et cetera, and they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're not made with uh, preservatives and all that kind of stuff. And... And there's, you know, they're a great company. They are, are again, are still the only one who has gone 100% GE-free. Mm-hmm. You know, when you were mentioning alfalfa a while back, at first I thought you were you were you were talking about the uh, uh, grasses, but there's been other some other genetic engineered things going on around here that have jumped. Well, the GE bent grass. Bent grass. And that, that also, uh, we forced them uh, also to we forced the USDA to uh, to institute or start creating a environmental impact statement it hasn't come out yet mm -hmm. we've been waiting for years and years and years so i yeah. think maybe they're just going to put that on the back burner and uh aren't i, don't, I mean i don't know we don't know if they're going to come out with it or not so the alfalfa is actually the first environmental impact statement which if you look at from 1996 on to 2010 you know, they've had hundreds of applications for different, you know, genetically engineered crops and trees and insects and animals and fungi, etc. And this is the first environmental impact statement. Now, we work on trees, right? Mm -hmm. Forest issues. And they do environmental or EISs all the time, environmental impact statements all the time on forest issues. And that's because there's a whole group of activists and organizers who are focusing on that and forcing these agencies for to decades. do that. Yeah. For decades. Yeah. And it just, you know, it, it, it is incredible that this is food. And this is the, f and we don't even eat alfalfa. We eat alfalfa through eating a cow or eating milk from a cow, mm -hmm. et cetera. And this is the first environmental impact statement on a genetically engineered crop ever. And it just came out and it's horrible and we need people to <laughs> make comments on it mm -hmm. and, and make sure that the, uh, the U.S. Uh, government and the Department of Agriculture says no to genetically engineered alfalfa. Mm -hmm. And so the, if the battle has moved from bent grass, the reason I brought that up is because uh, that would contaminate a fairly large industry in, yeah. in, in, in this particular state. And mm -hmm. uh, they just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't up to the state to do it. It was up to the federal government to allow this, right? Yeah. And so they, they just went ahead and, and uh, was it Central Oregon they were doing it? Yeah, over in the um, uh, Medford area, yeah, Eastern mm -hmm. Oregon. And, you know, amazingly, they just have kind of dropped it. So Forge Genetics and Monsanto, who are the producers of the Roundup Ready Creeping Bent Grass, mm -hmm. kind of dropped it, and the USDA has never actually come out with an environmental impact statement on it. So as of now, there are other smaller field trials of bent grass around the country, mostly for golf course. I mean, that's what this bent grass is designed for. And mm -hmm. eventually they want to use it um, on, you know, homeowner lawns as well. So the contamination aspect of that is incredible. If you actually did deregulate uh, bent grass for lawn use, for homeowner lawn use, it would go all over the country. Well, it would just it would cross pollinate with the existing lawns. Yeah, then. and it's it, it's a crop that cross pollinates readily, cross pollinates with multiple species, and has very light seeds and very light pollen, so it just spreads for miles and miles and mm -hmm. miles. Yeah, and thankfully that one is kind of on the back burner. We're still watching that, but they haven't come out with their EIS, and when they do. I'll be on your show again. Right. Probably. We'll be talking, we'll be talking about, about this and getting mm -hmm. another comment period and getting you know thousands more people to comment. All and right. Say no. Well, we got about a little less than 15 minutes here. We're going to open up the phones if folks want to call up. There's probably a lot of questions. This is a large subject, and I think I'll just fire something at you until the phones get going. What's this about fish genes in a tomato? <laughs> <laughs> They're really doing that cross species. Well, the tomato they haven't they actually haven't done much with tomatoes recently. They uh, the first the first ever genetically engineered crop that ever came on the market was from a company called Calgene. And it was called the Flavor Saver Tomato. And they had engineered a gene in the tomato, the, the, the gene that causes the tomato to start decaying, to start rotting. Mm -hmm. And they had reversed that gene so that the tomato wouldn't rot. 
And the idea was that they would pick this tomato basically red and, and ripe on the vine, and it would rot because it had, it had destroyed that gene that would mm -hmm. allow it to rot. But nobody would eat it. <laughs> well, they put it on the market for four months. Cal Gene, this was in, again in 1994, 96. Uh, spent over a billion dollars back in ninety-six dollars, ninety-five dollars. That's a lot of money. A lot of money back then, and uh, it failed. It was on the market for about four months. It tasted like kerosene. Nobody bought it. It was much more expensive than other tomatoes, and they dropped it. It's funny. You'd think that they would have been able to figure that out that it tasted like <laughs> kerosene. We'll get the first caller on the you air. First would've. caller. <laughs> first of two callers here. Hello, you're on the air. Ooh. -hoo -hoo. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Are your TV down? Hello? Well, that was a quick voice, and then he's gone. So, we'll work on getting that back. I'm glad the phones are lighting up, because there's a... Uh, oh, we got him up. Caller, you're on the air. Hello, caller. Well, we get a lot of dead air there. Hey, you're on the air. Hello? Hello, you're on the air. I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're on the air. No, right on, right on. Yeah, I, I uh... But you go to sleep there? On the <laughs> Alright. Yeah. Um, Which line do you have up? Two. Okay, um, my concern is when these, uh, uh, when these move through the system, through the uh, USDA or the FDA or, or whoever, um, and the corporations get their ball rolling, my concern is there's got to be some kind of a way to stop it before it actually goes into production because time and time again, as you said, uh, as, as you and your guests have said, things get put out on the market and it's up to the people to uh, voice their concern with their wallet mm -hmm. and then get it removed. Well, the damage has already been done. It's already out in the market. It's already out in the field. Um, the, the, the farmer in Canada is, is an excellent example of something that has gone horribly wrong and then, only then, once the people see how wrong it has gone, um, do the corporations or the government say, oops, my bad, and uh, there's absolutely no way to remove these things from the planet once they have been released. And I would like to know if there's a way to get these things stopped before they're distributed. Um, and uh, I, I will definitely go to NW Rage and uh, uh, the other website and uh, comment on both of these. And I had no idea about the sugar beets. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study up on that. Uh, thanks again. All right. Well, and that, and that is why Jim is having me on his show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because uh, we stopped sugar beets, right? We stopped alfalfa. We have had all this uh, work already on uh, GE trees. And now, for these three things again, we are in this process before they come on the marketplace. I'll get into sugar beets, which unfortunately we are actually currently eating uh, GE sugar from sugar beets. But with these GE trees, they're not on the market yet and they haven't been commercialized, which is why for these comment periods, two years ago we had 17,000 people say no. USDA came out with a revised environmental assessment. Assessment Doesn't look good. So now we're asking for 50,000, 150,000 people to say no, and eventually they might, they might listen to that. If they don't, then we have to deal with the pocketbook issue. Alfalfa, a lawsuit uh, stopped the planting of genetically engineered alfalfa. It was only planted for two years on less than 1% of all acreage in the U.S. It's a huge crop in the U.S., and it would actually impact export markets and all sorts of other markets. So now is again the time to, have to raise your voice and say no to genetically engineered alfalfa. The USDA claims that the American people don't care if their cows or their milk comes from cows that were fed genetically mm -hmm. engineered alfalfa. So we have to say... Yes, we do care, and we're not going to buy this product, and it is going to impact us, not just these small farmers. And now with sugar beets, you know, sugar beets were grown for two years. The sugar beets, gen genetically engineered Roundup Ready sugar beets from Monsanto, uh, the Willamette Valley in Oregon is the, basically we produce about 95% of sugar beet seed for the entire rest of the country to well, grow I sugar beets. 
and it was you know commercialized it was it was deregulated in 2005 and for three years because of citizen pressure on the sugar companies and Mars Candy Company and all these other you know craft and all these companies we said you know we're not going to buy your food if you allow if you use GE sugar so for three years they didn't then in 2008 they said whatever and they started planting it and instantaneously about 95 percent of all U.S. grown uh, sugar beets were genetically engineered. So for 2009 and now in 2010, we're still eating the, the last of that sugar. And now the industry is asking to be able to plant Roundup Ready sugar beets this year. And we're only talking about a couple months from now when they actually start planting those seeds. So again, now is another time to go to these websites and get involved and make sure that we don't, and sugar beet sugar is about 50% of all sugar in the U.S. It's sugar cane is 50% and sugar beet sugar is 50%. If you have a product that just says sugar on it, or in, in the ingredients, it's sugar beet sugar. Generally, all products will say cane sugar, which is sugar cane. Mm -hmm. So if you're buying a product today and for the last year that just said sugar, Unfortunately, you've been eating genetically engineered sugar beet sugar. Mm -hmm. So that's why these things are so important, and that's why you had me on tonight. That's the first line of defense. Because yeah. this is the time yeah. to make those comments and to raise your voice and say no. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have another caller. Get the next caller. Hello, can you oh. hear me? Uh, we can. Hello? You're on the air. Hey, great. Oh, um, welcome. You know, I've known about this for years, but it's really good. I'm kind of getting ready for a date, and I turned my TV on the channel. <laughs> Uh, 21, like, or 11, I think you guys are 11, yeah. It's great. It's great what you're talking about. Can you put up the website to leave it up there for me so that I can get that copied down? Is that the, one the, thing. the Rage and website? You answered, yeah, you answered my question. I can't hear you at all. Really? So I'm going to talk. <laughs> all right. Just but keep you talking. answered my question about the sugar you know, when you see a product that just says sugar, if it's sugar beet or, or cane sugar. So that's good for clarification. I try to stay away from all of it. I try to buy all my food organic and um, new seasons or, you know, wherever I can get organic food. But I wonder, is there genetically modified engineered products in my organic food and are they, do I have to label it or is, is it getting stuck into some of these other products that have potentially like 50% organic, but they call themselves organic, but they're really maybe not totally organic, and it's kind of deceiving for, you know, um, the public. So if you just want to clarify that, and All right. you're, what you're saying is great. So I'm just going to hang up and then turn my TV on so I can hear what you're okay. saying. <laughs> okay. She's actually take, taking it the direction I wanted to take it because of the, the fact that they're throwing, they're growing these and mixing them in, like, like soybeans and all these, yeah. so you don't know. It, it's a perfect question because, I, you know, Conspiracy theory-wise, you might consider this, but the biotech industry, for one, they want to confuse us. For one, they want to overpower us with having no other options to purchase anything in the grocery store but their products. And with the case of organic products, if it's 100% certified organic, meaning that every ingredient in that box of whatever it is is product, controlled, is controlled, yeah. is it, Organic certification does not allow any genetically engineered products or ingredients whatsoever. If you have a product that says organic, it's not 100% organic, there is the possibility that the non-organic parts of that product might be genetically engineered. Like with soy, say. Right. The company that is making something that is 95% organic is probably not going to. However, you should call that company, email that company. They all have free toll 1-800 uh, toll-free lines or emails and you should call them and say hey is this other ingredients that are in your products are they genetically engineered but the the reality is that organic certification uh, process does not allow any genetically engineered products or processes or anything in it whatsoever so there should not be any genetically engineered ingredients in organic products all right we got another call next caller well, we'll take one more call, and then we're running out of time down to about four minutes. Hello, next caller. You're on hey, the air. how you doing? Pretty good. Hey, you guys have really piqued my interest here. All mm -hmm. right. We've got about um, a minute or so my here. My question is, is when I go to plant my garden this summer and spring, how do I know whether or not I'm getting a, a GE plant or seed 
or if it is non-genetically uh, engineered? Good question. This is where the excellent question. This is, this is where the biotech industry has uh, feared to tread. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the biotech seeds are only available to farmers, large farmers, you know, 50 acres or more, or whatever. You, because of the patent system and because of the uh, control that the biotech industry wants and has over this whole uh, seed market. Any farmer who actually wants to buy GE seeds has to sign about a 25-page wow. agreement mm -hmm. that they will not sell their biotech seeds. They will not, um, if they have any extra left over, they will sell it back to Monsanto or DuPont or Dow. Um, they allow the company that they purchase the seed from to come onto their property and investigate their sales and investigate their crops wow. and investigate what they're growing, etc. So there isn't a single genetically engineered seed on the market for the home grower. You would have to sign this agreement. You'd mm -hmm. have to, you know, buy 100 kilos of seed. So right now, the biotech industry is afraid and, of course, not willing to sell to the home grower because, you know, the, the polls show that 60% of Americans want GE food to be labeled so that they can say no to buying it. Mm -hmm. So they know that the majority of people in this country don't want to be eating it, and they uh, get around that by just kind of secretly putting it in the food supply through corn, soy, cotton, and canola. So right now you are safe with, uh, with buying your seeds from Territorial or any of your grocery stores, seed mm -hmm. racks, etc. There's no GE. There is that does open up a, another can of worms that we don't have time to go into with about a little under two minutes. But uh, there is the Terminator seed situation where you know it might briefly give you know thirty seconds well, about and that's, what that's, and that's about. And that's part of the GE trees. The you know the uh, the GE tree, the eucalyptus trees that they're doing. They have basically a Terminator technology in there. They've introduced a gene that is like a killer gene that goes into the cells of the uh, of the pollen and basically slices them up. And so it makes them infertile, basically. So this eucalyptus field trial is basically one of the first terminator trait uh, crops that they're trying to introduce into the marketplace. And it's another reason why we all need to be commenting and saying no to these GE trees. All right. So it gives us a little less than a minute. We don't really have enough time to go into it. There's, you know, so many tangential uh, issues with this. I want to leave the folks with, uh, with one thing that you mentioned that... What was it? 20% of the human genome, 100% <laughs> has been mapped, and 20% yeah. has been patented. We'll have to do a show on that. We'll yeah. do a show on There's, that. There's uh, over 4,000 human genes that have now been patented, and we only have about 22,000. Well, we got about 30 seconds. We're not going to be able to go into that. <laughs> but that, to me, is horrendous. You know, yeah. that, that they're able to, that, the, not that they've done it, but that our government is allowing them to yeah. do it. We're supposed to have agencies that are protecting us yeah. from that type it's, of predator. It's not just food. It's not just trees. It's not just fiber. It's actually us as well as human beings that mm -hmm. they're trying to control and patent and create products out of. Right. And so yeah. uh, that's something, uh, something need, people need to get under Northwest Rage. NorthwestRAGE.org and uh, follow up some of the links and uh, find out about what we're talking about. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thanks for having me, Jim. All right. Thank you, Mark.